chapter number 27, the 27th chapter of Acts. Thank God for the people of God. Excited this morning about the Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing it is for us to come this morning to the Lord's house to be able to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. What better place could we be than in the Lord's house on the Lord's day? Singing, praying, clapping, worshiping, dancing, shouting, praising God our Savior. What a blessing. What a privilege and an honor. It's not a dread to be here. It's a privilege to be here. My God, it's a blessing to be here in the house of God. What a blessing. We thank God and we honor the Lord for it. Acts chapter number 27. It's a little lengthy in its reading. At some point, perhaps I'll let you sit down. Maybe I gotta stand, so maybe you should stand with me. And when it was determined that we should sell it to Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And in entering into a ship of uh, Drachmithium, we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. One Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. The next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when he had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when he had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Solomon, and hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the landing and, and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter, which is in a haven of Crete and lie toward the southwest and the northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. You may be seated. But not long after there arose against it in a tempestuous wind called Eurycliden, and when the ship was caught and could not bear it into the wind, we let her drive, and running under a certain island which is called Clauda, Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed, with a tempest the next day, they lightened the ship. And the third, third day, they we cast with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for that there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sell with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain land. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. 
and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the fourth ship, Paul said to the centurion, to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. And the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship two hundred three score and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and hoist up the main sail to win, and made towards shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck fast, and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the wave. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you now for the reading of this your word. We pray, God, that your spirit would minister to our hearts today, that we might receive this word and live by it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. I want to use for a topic this morning out of this text. Amen. Survive the storm. Can you say that? Survive the storm. Yes, look at your name and tell them, survive the storm. Come on, you got to be just one more person. There must be at least one more person you can make eye contact with and encourage them and tell them, survive the storm. Come on, put your hands together and praise God for the word of the Lord. Acts here 27 is a remarkable story uh, that's found in the annals of history relative to uh, this, this voyage to Rome, this, this trip uh, 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 amongst the sea, this uh, navigation that they had to endure, uh, trying to get from, as it were, uh, Corinth to Rome, get to the place where Paul had set in his heart, had set in his mind that he actually wanted to go and stand before Caesar. This is a remarkable story here relative to the shipwreck at sea uh, pertaining to Paul and this experience. Now, the events that precede this particular text, you have to go back to Acts chapter 20, where Paul, upon returning on his third missionary journey back to the holy city of Jerusalem, had brought some contributions to those that were poor, but the reputation had gone out that he had spent some time with the Gentiles, which his ministry was unto the Gentiles, and that there were some Greek associates that had uh, connected themselves to him. So the word had gone out that he had actually been hanging around around with Greeks, hanging around with the Gentiles, which actually defied the Jewish system and the Jewish custom. They went as far to say that not only did he affiliate with them, but he actually defiled the temple. He actually began, according to them, to participate in some of their practices, which brings us now to the place where, because they felt he had defied the Jewish system, they looked to punish him. They looked to penalize him. They looked, as it were, to throw him into prison. Now, this was not the first time that Paul was in prison. 
But again, Paul finds himself in a precarious situation, not because he had done anything wrong, but because he refused to take down for what he believed in what he was doing, that he believed God had called him to do, which was minister to the Gentiles. And here he finds himself thrown in prison, not because he did wrong, but because he was doing what it was that he felt was right to do. When you look at Acts 20, again, he brought these contributions. You look at Acts 24, 17, he was misrepresented for antagonizing, again, the Jewish system. Acts 21 tells us that uh, the story of where they accused him of defiling the temple. And then in Acts 25, he says, uh, here, here's what I'm going to do. I don't think I'm going to get a fair trial here, so I'm going to exercise my Roman citizenship, and I'd rather go to Rome. Doesn't look like anything is getting any better here where I am. I'd rather make my way to Rome. And so here, hence the text that we have in Acts 27, that upon this voyage to Rome, he runs into again uh, this, this shipwreck. He runs into this terrible storm. And I am preaching, amen, and ministering to this morning a crowd, an audience, a congregation of people that I believe, too, we can identify uh, with some respect, perhaps not the storm on the sea, but the storm of the sea of our life. There are some of us sitting here today perplexed and confused. There are some of us sitting here today dismayed and discouraged. There are some of us sitting here today not knowing how much longer we can take, we can deal, we can put up, we can persevere through what we are going through, the storm of our life. But I thank God for comfort in the Word of God. I thank God for comfort from the people of God. I thank God for the comfort that comes out of the fellowship of God. That yes, even you, even I, even we can survive the storm. Storms, they come, but the storm, as the songwriter says, eventually passes over. Uh, you know, sometimes when the, when the, when the uh, meteorologists have uh, predicted the forecast, and sometimes we don't actually take full credence, we don't give full heed. I mean, my God, Hurricane Sandy, I have to admit, it made me a believer. I was one of the ones that did not think that it was going to be as severe as it actually uh, played out to be. I, I sort of I sort of thumbs it down, but it made me a believer. Like so many of us made us a believer, uh, which is to suggest that when uh, the warning is hurled, when instructions are given, when there is uh, a forecast, we, we should do our very best to be diligent. That's, that's what the Word of God, when the Word of God is preached, when the Word of God is ministered, when the Word of God is taught, it's a forecast that we should pay full attention to. It's not something that we should downplay. It's not something that we should say, oh, I heard this before. Oh, I have read this text many of times. Oh, I have been in this position. No, we should not downplay it. Well, we should not take it lightly, but we should give ourselves and give ourselves to full credence uh, in, in accepting what is being said, making sure that we lend our ear, making sure that we open our heart, making sure that we get all that we can get out of what is being presented to us. So, amen, here Paul says, all right, I want to go before Caesar. I want to exercise my Roman citizenship. Uh, sometimes, even in the storms of life, again, you find yourself, we find ourselves in awkward positions when you don't uh, seem like you're getting the results uh, in this area that you feel that you should get. Sometimes you got to change your location. Sometimes you've got to get up from there and you've got to move on to the next place. How long will we just continuously sit in the same place uh, looking for different results but exercising uh, in the same behavioral patterns at some time you've got to change your mind, you have to change your heart you've got to change what you're doing and that's what Paul did I'm not getting anywhere with you all I had already went to the coast of Caesarea and you all were still adamant and vehement in terms of punishing me for what you said that I've done, I'm headed to 
Sharon. I'm getting ready to change, getting ready to change my position. I'm getting ready to change my location. But can I say to you that even when you make up in your mind that you're getting ready to change your mindset, you're getting ready to change your heart, getting ready to change your disposition, that it does not come without opposition. Sometimes you get ready to move forward and in moving forward you're doing what is right, but it does not come without opposition. There are those of us that just want to move forward without opposition. But the word of the Lord says in Peter, after you have suffered a while, he establishes you, he strengthens you, he settles you. But you cannot dismiss and or remove the suffering aspect. Paul says in Romans 8.18 that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Now you can't look forward to the glory if you don't endure the suffering. Suffering. He says again in the word of the Lord, after you suffer with me, then you shall reign with me. So suffering has its purpose. Suffering has to take its course. Whatever form of suffering it is that you may be going through, it is good that you go through it. It is good that I go through it. You know why? Because we need a testimony of our own. There's a time that as kids, uh, we, are, we are blessed to uh, be afforded to the opportunity or, or exposed to the things of God. And we we're singing songs that we were taught to sing. We pray prayers that we were taught to pray. But there comes a place in time after a season of development, maturity, and growth where you are no longer singing what you were taught to say, but you are singing because it is a reality in your life. You are no longer just praying prayers that you were taught to pray, but you understand the significance of that prayer. You understand the language, the tone, the fervency of that prayer because of life, trials, and tribulation. That's what he says in Romans 5, that we glory in tribulation because tribulation is worth it, uh, experience and experience uh, brings about hope, but tribulation work in patience and patience experience and experience brings about hope. So when we are going through situations that we really don't want to go through, don't even know sometimes how we got here to this place, what it's doing, even though we've cried to get out of it, we've prayed to get out of it, we have fasted to get out, we have named and claimed to get out, we have spin, blabbed, and grabbed, and slaw, and everything else to get out. We're still in it! We were in a rush to get into it, and it doesn't seem that God is in that much of a hurry to get us out of it. Because what the situation is doing, what the hardship is doing, is it's producing patience. It's producing a calmness. It's producing the ability to just wait it out. As hard as it is, you go to sleep and wake up and it's, it's still there. You hear the word that says live through it. Well, I'm here another day and it hasn't changed. You, you go to work and you, I've got a positive mindset today. I'm going I'm to look at it different. I'm going to take my perspective. The problems are still there. The situation hasn't changed. But tribulation, work in patience. You hear that word? Work in patience. It's not coming easy. It's working patience. Work is tedious. Work is laborious. Work is hard. It's working patience. Couldn't get you to keep still, but you, you, you get it now. You, you understand you're in the timeout chair now. You, you get to think about why you're here. In surviving the storm, the first point that you must remember, and that is, set your sails. Set your sails. Don't just go floating because of an opportunity that presents itself. See, every ship that takes the sea is not for you to get on. You've got to be able to set your sails. You have to be able to uh, have a goal. You need an aim. You need an objective. You need a destination. There are some people just floating through life. They're opportunists. Whatever comes their way is what they lean toward. Whoever wants to be their friend, that's who they befriend. Whoever wants to take them to lunch, that's who they eat with. No, no, no. You, you have to be able to set yourselves. Because when you set yourselves, not only do you underscore or, or recognize that uh, every ship is not for you to get on. Every passenger 
is not for you to travel with. When you set yourselves, you already have a vision. That's that word again. You already have. You already have. You already have a perspective. You already have a dream. You already have a goal. And this doesn't fit into it. Setting yourself. Paul had already set in his heart to go to Rome. He had already set in his heart to stand before Caesar, who was the Roman general. He had already set in his heart. He launched forth, and he wasn't by himself. The scripture numbers that there was at least 276 of them. A score equals 20. There was 276 of them on this ship. When you decide to set yourselves, according to verse number 2, uh, like they did, uh, you have to do what you can while you can. It says that at a certain place, they begin to sell, that Paul was actually allowed to go and visit. They gave him courtesy to go and visit some of his friends at the first stop. Now here it is, Paul, he's a prisoner on the ship. But they gave him a courtesy visit. We're going to let you go and refresh yourself, Paul. You have to be able to do what you can while you can. That's what we get from that, from that footnote there. Because in setting yourselves, uh, there, there are times that uh, you'll be able to do certain things at certain seasons of your life that at other seasons of your life, you won't be able to. You know, there, there, there's times when uh, the older saints, you know, that they have uh, paid their dues, so to speak. They, they have been faithful unto God. And, and there comes a place in time when some, sometimes, like even one of the oldest mothers, I went and visited yesterday and had fellowship with her. Uh, and she was, she was laying on her couch and she was looking out the window and she said, Lord, I, I, I wish that that was the church. Where I could just lay right here and, and see it. Because she's shut in and she can't get to the house of God at this time. But, but I would say to her like I've said to others. You, you've done what you could while you could. And so when you can't you don't have, you don't have any, you don't have any uh, qualms. You don't have any regrets. I'm faithful unto the Lord. And if there should come a place in time where I can't get. At least I can say Lord. I was faithful when I could. I, I went to church. I honored you. Just like Hezekiah. He was able to go back over his life. And pull out his resume. Of how he had walked before God. Do what you can while you can. There are some of you that have not spoken to individuals. You have not visited some loved ones. You have had, have, had no fellowship with those that you can. Hey when they're gone it's too late. You have to do what you can while you can. Because after the opportunity has passed you by, doesn't matter what excuse you come up with, it's illegitimate. It doesn't count. You have to do what you can while you can. They allow Paul to go and refresh himself. Not only that, uh, but they change vehicles. Because sometimes when you set your cell and you're doing what you can while you can, uh, sometimes the, the initial vehicle is not, it's not good. It's, it's not going to do the job. You, you can't be afraid to ship. You cannot be afraid uh, to, to launch out. You cannot be afraid to change vehicles. This vehicle is not going to get me where in my mind, in my heart, I'm selling toward. They change from one ship, they change to the next. And not only that, but in verse number 10, uh, uh, Paul says, Sirs, I perceive that this is going to be a dangerous journey. I perceive that this, uh, this journey is not going to be without hurt, it's not going to be without damage. In fact, we're going to have problems with this ship and, we, and our lives are going to be threatened. Somebody said, listen for the instructions. Listen for the instructions. Oh, we say amen, we're jumping on the seats, we're flipping over the seat, we're the first one at the altar when the instruction is convenient. When the instructions are, are, are tickling to our ears, nobody can outbeat us in saying amen. But the word of God does not only come to comfort us, it also come to correct us. The shepherd has a rod and a staff. Right. He has a staff to guide, but he has a rod to correct. And 
And according to Hebrews, even the chastisement from the Lord is a reminder that he loves us. So even the chastening of the Lord uh, is a reminder that he loves us. So Paul speaks out and says, I perceive that this is going to be dangerous. But who wants to listen to Paul? You're a prisoner on this ship. So the head, uh, the head keeper, Julius, he'd rather listen to uh, the captain and the rest of the staff that was on the ship than listen to Paul. Can I say to you, like surviving the storm of your life, sometimes you are speaking to people that have deaf ears to what you're saying. Sometimes you have people that are nodding you and, and, and giving you the indication that they understand the words that are coming out of your mouth and they really don't. Sometimes they do and they just are not going to do what you've asked them to do. Survive the storm. Feels like I'm talking to a brick wall. You are. Survive the storm. Sounds like I'm repeating myself over and over again. You are. Survive the storm. It doesn't seem like I'm getting through. You're not right now. Survive the storm. Paul, it does not take anything away from you and the instruction that you've given. You have done what you were supposed to do. Do what you can. The parent says to the child, one day you're going to get old. The same thing that we heard our parents say to us. Right. And then all of a sudden, it kicks in. Do what you can while you can survive the storm. Not only that, but point number two, they did not listen to Paul. They didn't stay at Creek. They decided to go forth. Every point that they, that they actually sojourned to after that, they found more uh, temptuous winds. They found uh, more contrary winds. The, the storm actually began to intensify itself. How many know that when you don't follow the instructions that are given to you, it doesn't get better? Even with the instructions that are given, it's not easy. So as they found themselves journeying from location to location, uh, there, there was one, one, one notorious one, you, you climbed it, which means a, a northeastern in modern day vernacular, that's what we call it. But there was this wind that, that just overtook the boat. Can I say to you, point number two, that life will take its course. The Bible says in Matthew 5 that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. You, you can get up out of the seat of do nothing now. You can come up out of the seat of depression. You can come up out of the seat of feeling poor me. No, it's not poor you. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Don't forget, suffering has to take its course in all of our lives. The wise man Solomon says to everything there is a season. We can't be picky and choosy of our seasons. Just last week, uh, we didn't need a sweater. We could walk outside and enjoy the sunshine. Lord, coming through last night, getting up this morning, my God. And the only way that you can escape the variation of the season or, or the changes in the season is just check out that. But as long as you live... As long as we live, we have to survive. We have to survive the storm. And remember that life will take its course. Uh, life will take its course. Life will take its course. There are inevitable winds. All there are times that you will cry, like all of us have cried. There are times that you will feel bad, like all of us feel bad. There are times that you will go through and feel like you can't come out of this one. Look at your neighbor tell me you're not on the boat by yourself. The more they begin to travel, the more intense the storm had become, and it actually began to sink like quicksand is what the Bible said. That's why I read through all of that so you can hear it afresh. And they started thinking to themselves, what are we going to do? Somebody said, we've got to lighten the load. Somebody said, lighten the load. See, when you're going through the storm of your life, you, you don't need the phone call and on the other end of the phone, there's nothing but pessimism. You don't need on the other end of the call, there, there's nothing good to say, nothing encouraging to say. At this time, at this season of my life, I don't need sympathy. I don't 
don't need a hand on my shoulder that's going to push me down further. I'm already in quicksand. So in lightning the load, they had to throw, as it were, the cargo that was on the ship. Because the ship, here's the thing, the ship didn't even belong to them. They were on a bar ship. How are you going to throw out what's not yours? Have you ever? Have you ever? Going back to the refrigerator? And you put in the refrigerator what you intended to be there when you got back to it, and somebody decided to lighten the load? You thought this Northeaster was a problem. You ain't seen nothing yet. You, you haven't heard anything yet, you know. There are some of us that are carrying burdens in our life from our childhood. There are some of us that are, are, are overwhelmed with, with, with burdens, problems, and pressure. True, that we could not avoid. It was inevitable. But at some point, you have to apply 1 Peter 5, 7, which is to cast all your care upon him because he careth for you. There are times that we stay up late at night all because we have not taken our burden to God. There's no sense of me, as the old people say, I'm worrying about it and staying up all night and God slumbers nor sleep. He neither slumbers nor sleep. I might as well give it to him. And I'm telling you, when you really give that burden to God, when you really give that problem to God, when you really give that situation to God, you can walk away and smile. You, you can walk away and really feel good. Why are you smiling? Has anything changed? Not yet, but it will. That's what Paul said in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God that has it all understand. Lord, I'm in the storm of my life, but I got so much peace. I'm going through hell, but I have peace. I'm going through trouble, but I have peace. I'm in a mess right now, but I have peace. He says in Isaiah 26, 3, that I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. you got to loosen the, the and lighten the load in your mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5 says, Casting down every imagination and every high thing that have exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity, every thought, to the obedience of Christ. When you start allowing your mind to run and to race and it start thinking on unfruitful thought, bring it into captivity. Your mind starts telling you are you are defeated, you are a victim. No, 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 you are a victor. You are not defeated. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You gotta bring that thought into captivity. You can't you can't control what goes in your mind, but you are held responsible for what you entertain in your mind. You have to put on the helmet of salvation because the first storm uh, or the first threat to the storm it works against your mind. The enemy's trying to get you to panic. He's trying to get you to jump overboard. Kill yourself. But how many know that the devil is alive? Except they stayed on the ship. They could not be saved. I'm telling you, I don't care how fast it seems like the ship is sinking. It doesn't matter how much the wind begins to blow against the ship. Whatever you do, don't get off of the, don't get off the ship. Don't get off the ship. There are some people telling, if I was you, child, no, but you're not me. What we need to do is lighten the load. Paul stood up again. Hey, y'all, it's me again. The angel of God was with me last night. Now, you know it's hard to talk to people the second time. After they didn't believe you the first time. But here's what happens between the first and the second. Life took its course. Yeah. Nothing like being chastised, receiving discipline, and while receiving the discipline, being reminded of what you did that got you in this predicament. Yeah. That's the way my grandmother used to be. She'd take you back to where it all started and then bring you up to speed. To try to help you remember, don't go here again. Right. So Paul says, hey, it's me again, y'all. The angel of God was with me last night. And if y'all had hearkened to what I said, if you would have listened to me, we could have stayed at Crete 
and we could have avoided this. We, we could have stayed there and let this pass us by. But no! He says, here's what's going to happen. I told you there would be danger. I told you there would be harm. But I believe God. That we are not going to die. I do have to get to Caesar. We are not going to die. In other words, it's almost as if God is going to save y'all because I'm on this ship. You, you sometimes you get all upset because people don't seem to understand what you're saying. They don't seem to be able to connect with you. But can I tell you that God is saving the ship of your home because you are on board. God is saving the ship of your child because you are on board. God is saving the ship of your community because you are on board. Now we don't say that arrogantly. We don't say that presumptuously. We say that by the grace of God. We say that because we have had a visitation from the Holy Ghost. We say that because God has spoken directly to our heart. And guess what? I believe God. I believe God over the economists. I believe God over the naysayers. I believe God over the haters. I believe God over the famous warning. I believe God. You used to sing the song, God said it. I believe it. And that sounds it. Doesn't matter how long ago he said it. It doesn't even matter if he shouted it from heaven. If he just whispered and I catch it. I don't have to wait for the battle to be over. I just get happy right then and there. Because I heard from Lord have mercy. He said y'all ought to be a good cheer. You have not eaten since the fast. For 14 days now the fast has been over. The fast ended at the end of September. They were about somewhere in the midst of October. Going into November. They were in the winter season. Paul said the fast is over. Somebody's going through the storm of their life. Have lost their appetite. Not just an appetite for food. But you've lost an appetite for happiness. You've lost an appetite for love. You've lost an appetite for peace. You've lost an appetite for friendship. You have lost an appetite. You have lost an appetite for the next door to open in your life. I'm telling you, it's time for you to eat. It is time for you to be a good cheer. I heard it from God. I got a word from God. It's tough right now, but you can be a good cheer. It's crucial right now, but I got a word from the Lord. Somebody say the bottom line. After they begin to eat, Paul bless the food. And when you get ready to go into the next season of your life, don't be ashamed to give God thanks. Don't care where you are. He was a prisoner on the ship, but he says, I'm not going to be foolish enough to just give you the word of the Lord. And then the provision of God in the midst of this storm, it happens for, and refuse to give him the thing. No, I'm going to thank him for this opportunity. I'm going to thank him for this season. I'm going to thank him for this day. I even thank him for this storm. I thank him for this form of suffering. I thank him for this dry season. I, I thank you, Lord, for this. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the lessons that you're teaching me. I thank you for the correction. I thank you for feeling lonely. I, I thank you for comforting me. I, I thank you for being in a mess. I thank you for delivering me out of the mess. I thank you, Lord. I, I thank you. I thank you. In the midst of all that I've been through, I still have my right mind. I got a mind to serve you. I got a mind to love you. I got a mind to worship you. He gave thanks unto God. He blessed the food. They begin to eat. It didn't stop the storm, no. He said, this is for your health. There's some things you need to do right now, right here, for your health. You need to stop worrying about that, and you need to eat. You, you, you need to get your spiritual food. You need to develop some healthy outlets in your life. You're killing your own self. You're self-destructing, and it's not good for your health. But the bottom line, somebody say, in surviving the storm, they said, now, those of you
you that can swim, y'all take to the sea. The centurion said, we need to kill all of them on the boat. Because they'll escape if they can swim. When the enemy figured that the storm couldn't kill you. He comes another way to take you out. He presents himself in a different fashion to take you out. But because no weapon formed against you can prosper. Because if we kill them, we got to kill Paul. There's Paul again. He said, those of you that can swim, take to the sea. Those of you that uh, can't swim, grab a board. Those of you that don't have a, just get a piece. Now the bottom line is, you're going to survive the storm. I don't know how you're going to get the land, but you're going to survive the storm. The bottom line is some people trying to figure out how, when, where, why. No, no, no. Some on boards. Some on broken pieces. But all saints got to land. You, you, you got to understand when you are in the storm of your life, you have to do whatever is necessary. If you only have a piece of a praise, hold on to it. If you only have a piece of a prayer, hold on to it. If you only have a piece of hope, Glory to God. Somebody's 